Welcome to the Property Investors Podcast. Thanks so much for tuning in. Make sure you subscribe so you never miss an upload. You can catch us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube. Enjoy this week's show and don't forget to share it with all your friends. Hey, I'm Russell Leeds. Hey, I'm Ricky Mandel. And welcome to the Property Investors Podcast. On this week's show, we're going to be looking at the five ways that property investors make money using debt. Oh, debt. See, that's the thing. That's the thing. A lot of people, when they hear debt, they think, oh. When I was growing up, for sure, debt was always seen as a bad thing. You do not want to get into debt. It's kind of drilled in you as, as a child. Did you have the same thing? Same thing. Same thing. Bad. What, why do you think people are so scared of debt? I think because a lot of people use debt in, in a bad way. <laughs> yeah. And then sort of had a bad experience. Now, they're not trying to... All people are trying to do is protect you, aren't they? That's why they say, don't get into debt, pay off the debt. But it's because they've had a bad experience with it or they know someone that's had a bad experience and there's like this whole thing around it where it's, there's, there's no such thing as good debt. It's all bad. Mm. Yeah, I, I would say that debt is a tool in the same way that money is a tool. So money can be used for good, it can be used for bad, right? It's just a tool. It isn't good, it isn't bad. It's a tool. And debt's the exact same. Debt is a tool that can be used for good, can be used for bad. However, rich people use debt in a very good way and poor people tend to use debt in a bad way. Poor people tend to buy liabilities with debt. They tend to put their weddings on debt. They tend to put their holidays on debt. Like, if you put your, ho- if you, if you put your holiday, let's say you buy a 10 grand holiday, you go on a holiday, it's gone in a week. <laughs> it's gone in a week. It's, got, it's finished. Been... And, you, and then afterwards, you've, been, you, oh, you might, you've, you've enjoyed the holiday, you've relaxed, but then you've got the stress of paying the holiday off for however long <laughs> once it's finished. Look at the amount of money people spend on weddings. Yeah, it's crazy. Weddings isn't gone in a week. Weddings is gone, well, I say. The wedding day yeah. has gone in a day. Yeah. How much better would people be if they spent the amount of money they spent on the wedding? Some people are spending 30, 40,000 pounds on a wedding. I think the average is, I heard a few years ago, I don't know what it is today, but about 18,000 pounds. People are spending 18,000 pounds on a day. Imagine if they invested that money in a house and invested that money in their future rather than spending it on a day. Some people might want big weddings. Yeah. You want a big wedding, don't you? You're saying, you're saying this because you're planning on getting married and you want to spend, you want to spend a fortune. Here's the thing though, right? You're going to be spending, you're going to be spending a lot of money on your wedding using money that you've earned from, debt. from property, yeah. from debt. Yeah, right. yeah. All right, so how, we're talking about debt and debt's a good thing if you use it correctly. How do property investors use debt for their advantage. And I'd say one of the big ones, first of all, number one, is they use mortgages. Yeah. They borrow money for leverage. You can't do that with a lot of investments, can you? No, there's, there are a few strategies that if you're looking to invest, there are a few strategies that you would, we, 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 we you know, encourage you to buy it with cash, depending on the strategy. But generally speaking, you'll be buying with a mortgage. The only time you really buy with cash is if you're looking to recycle the money back out yeah. and get a, a quick return off the money that you put in. Like a flip, you might you yeah. might buy it, do it, quickly sell it, or yeah. you might buy it, refinance and it. And one of the reasons that we wouldn't even buy with a mortgage is because we're looking for, with that particular strategy, buy, refurbish, refinance, we're looking for properties that can't even qualify for a mortgage. Yeah. So it makes sense in them cases, but generally speaking, if you're, if you're looking to invest in a property to get a return on your investment, you need to buy it with a mortgage. Yeah. We don't need to, but, but it me, makes sense. Here's the really interesting thing about how you can use you can use a mortgage or you can use you know bridging finance or whatever it is that you're borrowing money to buy property. Here's why it's so brilliant. Let's give you a question, Rick. If you had a hundred thousand pound, yeah. Now let's keep it. Let's yeah, we'll do a hundred thousand pound. If you had a hundred thousand pound and you invested it in the stock market, yeah. And in ten years, the the, the stocks that you invested in doubled in value in 10 years, 100,000 pounds, stock market, they've doubled in value. How much money would you have made in that 10 year period? Well, you would have made 100,000 pounds. Correct. Good, I'm glad. <laughs> I was worried then, I nearly had to get a calculator. Quick, quick math. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right, so yeah, you, you put 100,000 pounds in, it doubles in value over time, you've made 100,000 yeah. pounds. If you bought a property for cash, yeah. and it doubled in value over 10 years, which yeah. it often does, you would have also made £100,000. Yeah. However, let's say you used a mortgage. So you only put in £25,000 and you bought four properties, for example. 
right? With that hundred thousand pound, you use mortgages, you use debt, you use leverage. So you put twenty five thousand pounds into that house rather than buying it for cash. Yeah. In ten years' time, it's doubled in value. But your money in this case hasn't doubled. With the other examples, your money doubled. In this case, you'll have made hundred thousand pound in equity. So your twenty five grand. That says the same. Would, would, say, would say the same, but you've now made 100 grand, so you've now got 125 grand in equity and still got your 75 grand mortgage. Yeah. So your money has, 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 has far, is five times bigger than it was. It's worked for That you. 25 grand is now worth 125 grand. Yeah. Rather than 100 grand being worth 200 grand. So you're using debt to get leverage and gain from appreciation because your deposit stays the same as the debt that. Exactly. That so pr- property investing is, is what, like, if you, if you buy gold, if you buy stocks, anything like that, you have to pay the full amount. You can't get a mortgage yeah. on stocks. Yeah. Well, I guess that brings us on to, uh, I guess, another point is, is appreciation. It's another way that you'd make, you'd make your money, isn't it? So you're borrowing money to buy properties with a mortgage and, and bridging finance or whatever. You could even do joint ventures as well, borrowing off other people. It's the yeah. same thing. You're still in debt to them because you owe them the money back. But when you're borrowing that money and you're leveraging, you can also, I guess, another way is from appreciation. Like we just said, it going up in appreciation um, and the debt goes up. Yeah. Your deposit stays the same, but you benefit from that uplift. 100%. So you, you're, you're leveraging mortgages. You can use bridging finance, like you said, joint ventures. You could, you could, the very first deal I did uh, was exactly like this. It was a combination of those two, right? So I, I used leverage. I used a mortgage. And for the rest of the deposit, I actually borrowed the money from a joint venture partner who I was given a fixed return to. Over seven years, I paid back the, uh, I paid back the, the JV partner, their, their fixed term. I also paid the interest payments on the mortgage. Uh, so seven years in, I'm paying off the mortgage. The property went up in value by about 100 grand. So I made 100 grand from the capital appreciation using none of my own money. Now you might think, yeah, but you had to pay back the loan. You had to pay the interest payments. Surely, surely, Russell, interest payments are dead money. Surely paying the loan back is dead money. I hear this all the time. Yeah. Interest payments, dead money, it's dead money. But here's the thing, I didn't pay it back. Because this brings us on to the next one, which is rental income. Yeah. So you can use debt to buy a property and you can create rental income from that debt, which seems really obvious, right? But there's so many strategies all at once in play here. So the rental income I was getting from this property, it was covering the interest payments on the mortgage and it was covering, covering the loan repayments. So I put no money into this property whatsoever and then somebody else paid off my interest payments and paid off my loan that I'd used to buy the property and I was making a small profit every month as well. So I made like 100 grand in capital appreciation without using any of my own money. Well, it's one of the reasons why property is, is such a good investment because there are investments that you can make where you, you're, you're waiting, aren't you? Mm. You're waiting for the appreciation and then you, make, you, you take out the money. But properties gives you that appreciation, but also gives you the rental income. You know, and for, in my, from my eyes, I see as appreciation is great. You, you know, this is how people become accidental millionaires because they buy properties, it goes up in appreciation, and then they've got that net there that makes them an accidental millionaire from the uplift. But the thing is as well, with um, the rental income and the appreciation, the way that I kind of see it is, we would buy properties for the return on investment and the cash flow that you get from it. The appreciation is just a bonus. There are investments you can make where you're investing for the appreciation. Yeah. But generally speaking with property, when you're just looking to buy it out and rent it out, you're buying it for the return on investment from the rent and the money you put in, and the appreciation is just a bonus. Yeah, well, the, the, I suppose the, the rental income that you're getting is giving you the cash flow, isn't it? Yeah. Because the appreciation, you don't actually, at the, t- at the time, it's just, it's just kind of a number on, like, oh, yeah, the property's worth this. Well, appreciation oh. don't pay the bills. No, no. That's the, the thing. Appreciation doesn't pay the bills. So the rental income will give you the cash flow. The appreciation is building up in the background. But the, appre- the appreciation is what's going to make you rich. Yeah. If you, if you can start buying properties that are going up in value, like you say, people are becoming accidental millionaires. People that are buying properties, paying off the mortgage, and the property prices are going up. And one thing that we, we know about property prices is that over time, they go, they go down, for sure. You have recessions, then you have expansions, then you have recessions, expansions. But over time, it's going up, going up, going up, going up. And that's one of the things I love about property as well, is the historical 
you know, we can look back at history. If, if you're investing in, say, Bitcoin, what's Bitcoin going to be like in 10 years? I don't know. I don't know because I've got, I've got, no, I've got no history. I, I yeah. can't see what it, it, it... It might be that another coin comes out. It might be that cryptocurrencies are, 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 are all scrapped and there's just one cryptocurrency that the government control and they're all the values... Dro- I don't know. You've got but, nothing to go off. You, we, we can't tell. We don't know. I mean, and there'll be experts that say they know, but the thing is... No one knows for sure. Nah. People that think they know a lot about these these things. If you, I was, saw an, heard an interesting stat the other day about the um, about the index funds and stuff and stocks, and they said that literally just looking at what happened over the past and averaging and averaging what the average growth rate was year on year was more accurate than the top experts that predicted what the, the markets were going to do. Wow. So literally just looking at what happened in the past, averaging it out, roughly it's going to be about that, was more accurate than what the top experts thought. Yeah. It's crazy, yeah. isn't it? It is. It, and the other thing is this as well, with property, it's never going to go out of fashion. You know, when, when you said uh, about Bitcoin and stuff, we don't know what it's going to do, we don't know what... The thing is, t- property's not going to go out of fashion. No. People are always going to need somewhere to live. They're going to, someone's always going to be selling a house. Someone's always going to be wanting to buy a house. It's, it's never going to, no one's going to wake up one day and just be like, hmm. Yeah. Oh, I don't fancy living in a house anymore. <laughs> I no. mean, they, I don't know, they might do, I might be wrong, but I, I highly doubt it. No, so I it's agree. never going to go out of fashion. Um, so, leveraging off mortgages, you've got the appreciation, which is great because you're gaining from using debt to buy it and then gaining from the appreciation. You've got rental income. What's another one? So, obviously, we touched on, touched on capital appreciation, kind of linking back to the mortgages as well. You've obviously you've got mortgages, mortgages, but you've also got uh, bridging finance. You've got development finance. So, for ex- if you you use a, br- a bridge to buy a property that's unmortgageable, and then use development finance to refurb and do up the property, using all this debt. Yes, you're gonna have to put some money in yourself, but using a lot of debt for this to refurb a property, get the property good, and then you, once you've added the value, you can then sell it on. Yeah. Right. So. You can use the debt as well to refurb the property, for sure. I think yeah. you need to look at all the different options that are available. Well, it is an you. interesting point, actually, because people that are looking to buy houses and invest in houses and do them up and do flips, a lot of people are, that I speak to, um, you know, they're talking about buying it with a mortgage, and if it is unmortgageable, then they're going to need the cash, which, I mean, to an extent, you're correct, you're going to need cash to buy it for no mortgage, but it doesn't have to be your money. Mm. And a lot of people aren't aware of what bridging is and how it works, and... You know, for anyone that doesn't know, I mean, a bridging, it's just another tool that you can use. It's a short-term loan that is, is the purpose of it is to buy a property and then to do the fix a problem or make it mortgageable. And then you exit after 12 months, maybe a couple of years, pay off the, the bridge loan and then you, you refinance it onto a mortgage. So, you know, what, what I would say though is bridge, bridge loans, if you're not familiar with them or you're not educated with them, then there is an element of risk, like anything, like yeah. any investments. You know, there is an element of risk. Um, but bridge loans are, uh, are super useful if you're looking at cash purchases because they're seen as cash. Yeah. Because you know, it's not as it's, it's a different conveyancing process to when you're buying a, a house with a mortgage to, to when you're buying a bridge in. And also, a lot of lenders that do do bridge in, um, and a lot of companies out there, if you speak to a bridge and broker then you do have options of development finance as well. Mm. You know, and with what I've found with bridging and these short-term loans is every kind of, every deal is different. So one deal you might be able to get a bridge loan for 80% loan to value plus 100% of the development, but then there may be others where you might get a little slightly less lower development, uh, sorry, bridge loan and more of a development, but there might be some where, some cases I've seen 100% bridge loans. We, we've had students that have got 100% bridge loans yeah. You know, they've come to us, they've, they've bought us a deal, we've introduced them to one of our brokers, and um, they've come back and said, we've got 100%. So there are ways to do it. It's if the deal's about, good enough, yeah. if the deal's good enough, that's the thing, right? If you can get, if, if you don't have money, but if you can find really good property deals, if you've got the skill to find really good property deals, you will be able to get the money. Well, Samuel says this a lot, doesn't he? He says, find the deal, get the skills, Find good deals, become valuable, and the money will come. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. Another way um, that you can make money using debt is through the tax benefits. Now, there's been a big deal that you know over the last few years in in, in, uh, in property in the property investors world about Section Twenty Four, 
and about how when, you've, when you use a mortgage, your interest payments, you can't claim back as a tax deductible expense. And what does that mean? It means if the interest payments are, are high, you could be, let's say the rent was only 500 pound and the interest payments are 500 pound, you still have to pay tax on the full 500s, right? Yeah. You can't claim the interest payments back as a tax deductible expense. However, if you buy in a limited company, you are able to claim the interest payments back as a tax deductible expense. So there's actually many tax benefits as well to, to using debt. And one of the really big ones is refinancing. A lot of people, when, they, when we talked earlier about capital appreciation, you said it doesn't pay the bills. It actually can pay the bills. Go on, and talk to me. Right, so let's say for, uh, the one I was just talking about, my property, right? I said I made £100,000. How did I get hold of that money? Well, there's two ways to get hold of it. Either it just sits there, like you say, it doesn't pay the bills, or you can sell the property. But if you sell the property and you make a, a lot of money, you have to pay tax on the money that you've made, right? However, if you refinance the property, you can pull money out of the deal, which is basically debt. You're pulling debt out of the deal because you're getting a mortgage and you don't pay tax on debt. So you can then use that money to invest in another property. You could use the money to pay the bills as you speak, as you say. So you're, you actually are pulling the capital appreciation out by refinancing the property, but not having to pay tax on it. How crazy is that? That's crazy. I'm still trying to think about the paying the bills thing, though. Well, if you've got, well, you've got, the, you're pulling money out, you can pay any, pay bills with it, right? <laughs> yeah, I know, but what I mean is, bills are a monthly thing, aren't they? So if you refinance or go to sell a house, you'll get paid. You'll get well. You might not get. You, you'll take out a lump sum of money. You'll be, yeah. you'll be left with, and then once you've paid, it, let's say you pay the bills. Yeah. With that lump sum. Right. That, that might last you a year. Oh, a year. Well, you don't know. Uh, your, your bills might be really expensive. Let's say you pull out a hundred grand, yeah, and your bills are a hundred grand a year. All right, well done. You've paid your bills for a hundred grand for uh, a year. Now you've got to do it all again to pay the bills. What yeah. do you do after that year? I, I, I see. What, my point is, I see what you're saying. You're not, <laughs> not going to use it for your cash flow. Like, it's not like rent, right? I see what you're saying. Yeah. But my point is, is that is that before we talked about capital appreciation, we were kind of acting like. It's just a number on a, it's just, oh, that's my part of my net worth, but I can't get hold of the money. What I'm saying is, you can refinance it. You can pay no tax. Well, this is where it goes into like a, a, it's more leverage, isn't it? Because you can refinance, pull out that equity that you might have. And then invest, with that, invest in, in something property. else. But don't get a mortgage, uh, sorry, get a mortgage, don't buy yeah. cash. Get a mortgage and invest that into another property. Get a mortgage, get some, uh, get another return investment coming in. And this is how you, you build multiple streams of income with property. And, th and this is, you know, compounding. Yeah. You, compounding your wealth. I, I read a thing about Warren Buffett. Um, and obviously he is, you know, known as the greatest probably investor of all time. And they were looking at his annual, and it, annual in interest earnings, how much he's managed to appreciate his money. And it is good. It's good. It's, it, he's averaging about 20%. <laughs> what are you laughing at? I'm not. He's the greatest investor of all time. And they've averaged his returns. And it's, it's good. Yeah. <laughs> That's the point, though. How is he... The, when he's only averaging 20%, which, listen, it, it, it is good. But when he's only averaging 20%, there are other investors that are doing better than him on, a, on an annual basis. Okay. So, so why, why is he one of the greatest? Why is he one of the greatest? The reason is his longevity. He's been, he's been investing since he was 11 years old. And he's now, what, in his 80s? Yeah. And he's still getting 20%. And 20%, it just compounds over time. It's like, have you heard the story about the doubling penny? No. Right, let me ask you a question then. Oh, I'm right. glad you haven't heard the story about the doubling penny. I think I've probably seen it somewhere. Is it like, would you rather take a penny now or, uh, that doubles every day for the next so many years or a million pounds or something? No. All right, here, here you go then. What would you rather? All right. right you got, would you rather I gave you a million quid cash today? Yeah. Or a penny that doubled in value every day, but only for 30 days? So a million pound cash or a penny that doubles in value, but not for years, like the one you've heard, it only doubles for 30 days. So day two, you're on 2p. Day three, you're on 4p. Yeah. Yeah, what would you... So sorry? then obviously at the end of the 30 days, it'll be, that'll be more than a million. Well, I'm asking, I don't know, you tell me, will it? 
I think at day 10, you're on about fiver. Yeah, but then that will double 10. To a tenner, yeah. All right. Here's my answer. Go on. My answer is this. Because I've seen this and people are like, oh, I'll take the penny because it doubles every day. Yeah, Listen, yeah. this is what I would do. Go on. I would, if it's more than a million, let's say it doubles to more than a million, I would wait the 30 days and then I'd take the money of that course, I've made. Of course, of the, course. The point is, what do you think is going to be more? That's the point. What do you think is going to be more? The penny that doubles. Have you got your phone? Yeah. Go your phone. Let's work it out. I'll, te I'll, te I'll tell you the stats. Get your put your calculator up. Go on. What's the, what's right, the calculator? So do one times two and then press equals. So that's day two. Now press equals again. Day Day three, four, five, five six, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty. Do you want? Oh, hold on. Where are we up to? Twenty-two. We're, we're at two thousand. Are we at two? Two million. Two million. Yes, yeah, so I'll just wait. Just wait. See how it gets worth more. Oh. Isn't, isn't it crazy? But that shows the power. Now that's at a fifty percent. That's a hundred percent interest, right? So if you're if you're doing twenty percent, it's slower. But they were saying if Warren Buffett had only been investing like this for like 30 years, he'd be worth in the millions. But because he's been in it for so long, compounding over time, he's in the billions. And that's where you can use leverage to massively increase the speed at which you make your money. I'm still thinking about that question. Which question? The, 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 that one that you just asked about the million pound thing. What's just, most people's it, answers? I don't know. Answer the comment. I mean, they're all going to say that they're all going to say the uh, the penny. Well, now, they're not going to say. They yeah. know. But what would you? No, have but said? I don't get the question though because you're, you're asking the question. Yeah, like, what would like, you rather have? A penny that doubles every day for thirty days or a million quid? How can you not get that question? No, I get it. But what I'm saying is, why do I don't? It's a bit of a, it's a bit of a ridiculous question. Like, is, it, is the purpose of the question to see if someone's quick at maths? No, the purpose of the question is the pen. The, it, I, get you, what the, I get if what you you're saying. But if you didn't know. It's not super quick at maths, it's to prove a point. The purpose of the question is to, sh is to show that the penny doubling every day, in your head, it sounds like it's going to be worth nowhere near Yeah, in your million. head it does. Because when we, when we think of things doubling and stuff, when we think of like interest compounding, we very much think in the way of adding stuff up. So like, like if, we, if I say what's well, eight, add 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 eight. Yeah. Eight times nine, basically. Yeah, it's, like yeah, seven, yeah. And you, it's like, okay, that's how things go up. Whereas when you add multiplication in, eight times eight times eight times eight times, the, the number is ridiculous. Basically, basically, what the question is, is would you rather have a million pounds a day or have 10 million pounds in no, that's 30 not, days time? No. But you're asking it no. in a way where it's, you're trying it's not, to emphasize... What no, mean, not the point at all. You're no. completely missing the point. No, I get the point. What I'm saying is that's the same question, isn't it? No. No, but the point's different, but it's the same question. <laughs> Obviously, you'd rather have 10 million in 30 <laughs> days. Right, it's not a question, is it? Do you want a million today or 10 million in 30 days? Of course you're gonna go for 10 million. The, that's, the question is irrelevant. The point yeah, is the point. to show the power of compounding and how when stuff compounds very, very quickly, it can massively grow. That's the point. Okay. Forget the question, just remember the <laughs> that's point. That's the point, okay. Get the point now. Got it. Got the point, all right. Got it. So, to, I suppose to, to sort of sum up, in summary, in summary, five key ways that you can make money using debt. Number, well, before we even get to that part, remember that debt is your friend, right? Is debt your friend? Yeah, I would say, is it my best friend? I mean, you're up there with my best friends. Oh, thank you. But... Debt's probably a better friend than you. So, yeah, debt's up there, yeah. De debt is your best friend. <laughs> yeah. Better than Perry. <laughs> oh, oh, I didn't think of that one. Um, no, Perry's, she's always going to be up there. She's number one. So, and Perry's then, number one. And then debt. Then debt. And then, oh, then I've got to choose between you and Samuel then. Yes. Oh, my Come goodness. On. Podcast partner. <sighs> Will Samuel listen to it? I don't know if he'll listen to it. Nah. Nah, all right. So, you go Perry, yeah. debt, you, Samuel. Ah, okay, cool. I like it. I like it. <laughs> So yeah, you've got to make you've got to make debt your friend in the same way that Ricky is friends with debt. Bit loserish, but but it's a good <laughs> point. It's a good point. You've got you know, you've got you've got to use debt. It's a tool. It's not a friend. It's a tool, and you've got to use it as a tool to make you a lot of money. And the ways to do that: number one is leverage. Use mortgages. Number two, once you've you've bought it with debt, you can make money for your rental income. And don't forget as well, we were obviously talking about sort of buy to lets, but there's lots of ways of making a lot of money using 
much better rental strategies such as service accommodation. Or, or, yeah, service accommodation, but also just to add on to that point, absolutely, because right now with the way interest rates are and stuff, I, I mean, I don't know what your views are on this, but doing a buy to let is risky. What, in case the interest rates go up yeah. even higher? Yeah. What do you think the interest rates will, I mean, the experts, I, get, I, know, I know I sort of poo-pooed what the experts were saying, but they think they're going to sort of go up a little bit more at the end of 2023 and then drop. Um, so we're looking at about 6%, 7%. I mean, historically, historically, interest rates have been up as high as 14 15%. When I was born, wow. interest rates were 14%. Now, I've never known that because by the time yeah. I was even a child, they've been super It's quite low. interesting though, because they're, they're high, but then the, the, you know, the value of a house was a lot less. Mm. But then, so money was worth. But interest rates have been the lowest that they've been ever over the, you know, during our investment. Interest it's, rates have been so it's, low. It's interesting, isn't it? Typically, they have been about 4 or 5% and peaked as high as 14, 15%. Would the interest rates stop you from buying a house now? No. No. I still, I would, even with high interest rates, I still think that debt and mortgages, it's the way to go. You just gotta make sure that when you, you just gotta take that into consideration. Well, this is the point, isn't it? Is that's why I say about buy to lets, because right now, it can, it can be hard to do a buy to let. You know, a few years, five, 10 years ago, it was fine. You could buy a house up north, really cheap, nice, good return investment. But now, everyone's worried about the interest rates going up, people are breaking, even people are losing money. So that's why you should, be renting it out as service accommodation or HMO and getting the super rent. Because then even if, worst case, interest rates fly up, you've got enough of a profit margin to mm. still be able to profit even if they do go up. Yeah. Also, I think it depends on your goals. What's your goals? Is your goals, are you doing it for cash flow? See, when, I, when I'm investing now, I'm more bothered about buying for, for long-term wealth. I'm not yeah. super bothered about cash flow because I'm earning a lot of cash flow anyway. Yeah. So it's not like I need the extra money. Obviously, listen, I'm not going to turn it down. <laughs> you know, it's nice to have. But if I broke even on my on, if I bought a new property and it broke even, but it was still I was still gaining in capital appreciation long term, it's still worth it for me. Yeah. Um, so I think it depends on your goals. But 100 service accommodation, HMOs, it will protect you from high interest rates. Yeah. It Work will. out the interest rates at 15. percent Yeah. And say if interest rates 15, percent am I still going to be able to break even? Yeah. with a service accommodation property, with a HMO. And if you are, then you know, they're not going to be at 15%. For, they, they might, I don't think they will. I think they'll drop back down. I don't think they will. But if they did, what would you do then? What's the worst case scenario? And that's when, you know, when you're buying any investment, you need to look at it in the cold light of day. What's the best case, likely case, worst case? And then you've got to make your decision. And if the worst case is it goes up to 14% and that's going to make you bankrupt, it's probably not worth investing in it. No. If the worst case is 14%, and you're doing it as service accommodation, so you'll break even for a year or two until they drop back down again, it probably is worth it. So it's just weighing up the options and making sure you make a smart investment. But although leverage is amazing, you don't want to over leverage because what you don't want to do is be in a situation where the interest rates go up and now you've got all these properties and you can't afford to pay the mortgages because because the interest rates have gone so high and the buy to let's not covering it and you're screwed. You've got to start selling properties. But because the interest rates have gone so high, no one wants to buy them, so you're forced to sell them at a loss that's the sort of thing that happens when you over leverage. So it, that's why people are scared of it because it is a tool. You've got to use it correctly. You've got to know what you're doing when you use leverage. Yeah. You've got to assess the risks and you've got to, and you've got to invest smartly. Um, so I wouldn't over leverage. Make sure, make sure, or if you do over leverage, if you leverage high, make sure you've got cash in the bank to cover it. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I would never be, I'd never want to be, put, put me personally in a situation where I had no cash. Because even though cash is not a great investment and money in the bank does drop, cash is so liquid. It covers you in the case of an emergency. Well, they say keep six months worth of running costs in the bank. Yeah, for, a business. for a business. Yeah, yeah, for a business. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. 100 and and, and you're, if you're investing in property, that is a business. Yeah. So you should be keeping, keeping money in the bank for... Well, yeah, if you treat it like a business, it'll pay you like a business. Treat it like a hobby, it'll pay you like a hobby. You like that one? I like, I don't, I, do you know what? I think, I think, why don't you say that again, but say it really seriously. I think that'd be a brilliant ending. Okay. okay you know? Go. If you treat hobby... Oh, no, you've killed it. You've no, got to do it again. Know. Smooth, okay. Okay. straight in. You ready? So that's all about leveraging. Also, here's another thing as well. This is a top tip. Yeah, top tip. I'm, I'm going to leave you with this because it's just... Ah, that's it's, a good idea to leave them with this. I like it. Go. 
If you treat property as a hobby, it will pay you like a hobby. If you treat it as a business, it will pay you like a business. Powerful. I'm Russell Leeds. I'm Ricky Mandel. See you next week.